Man, I hate it when that happens. You're in the middle of a really good conversation with somebody and your batteries die. Jeez, peace, Louise. Let's go back to Carter, okay? I don't have any idea where we were with Carter. That was a while ago in our family. You don't get to stop taping with four kids and you get interrupted, so you know how that goes. Anyway, so Carter. Thinking about uh, our expectations of Carter as far as the big question on everybody's mind is, is, is Carter going to be gay or not, okay? And it's whispered and hushed tones as if, like, is he going to be a serial killer, okay? Because our culture is very heteronormal, okay? Our assumption is that kids are going to grow up and be heterosexual children, okay? And there's still a lot of bias against people who are gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgendered. And so in, in Carter's dad's eyes, this would be a terrible thing if Carter took, grew up and was gay. In Carter's mom's eyes, there are far worse things that Carter can be. But it's a very challenging thing for a kid who exhibits gender atypical behavior to grow up in this society where we expect kids to, to engage in gender typical behavior. Carter is supposed to be hunting and fishing. In fact, Carter's father just got back from, from you know, his big fishing trip to the Canadian Rockies, you know, and the spear caught fishes with his, stomped on fishes with his bare feet and caught them with his bare hands and everything else, okay? So, so what we've got is this expectation of Carter around how he's supposed to gender, very rigid role restriction around what he's supposed to be, and his atypical gender behavior doesn't fit in that, and that's very difficult for this little kid who's just five, okay? Is Carter going to be gay? Well, we don't know, okay? There's a long way between here and there. Do kids who are gay exhibit more gender atypical behavior? Absolutely they do. When you look back on their life, they, te they tend to do that, okay? Does that mean that Carter's going to be gay? Not necessarily. We'll, we'll have to see how that plays out for Carter as he sorts through who he is and what sex he prefers to be with and, and how he identifies himself as he becomes a young man later on. But it's really a challenge for kids who are gender atypical. The, 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 what we want to do with children is we want to raise children who are really androgynous, okay? Now, that may seem like a bad word for some of you, and I, I, it shouldn't be a bad word for you. What it means is that kids that have both a sense of themselves as far as being masculine and feminine, feminine and embody both traits, okay? So Sandra Bem's term for this is androgyny, and I'm sure, again, you're going to talk a lot about this term, so it's a very cool term. But what it means is that you, you as a person, exhibit the best of some feminine traits and the best of some masculine traits, okay? So you can change your own oil and you can bake brownies. You can be cry and sensitive and still be strong. You can be a lot of different things and you don't get bound up in terms of what your gender dictates that you are. Instead, you exhibit the best of masculine and feminine traits. And, and generally, people who are more androgynous tend to be happier in their lives, tend to be perceived as more well-rounded, better liked people. So we really want kids to be more androgynous, okay? But our society doesn't do that very well. So this summer, for example, one of the things I'm working on with our kids, so ages remember 9 through 13, they're learning how to sew. They're learning how to do some basic cooking beyond just making ramen noodles, okay? I want all of my children to learn to sew, not just my girls, okay? Why would I want a boy not to know how to hem pants or darn a stocking. Uh, that's important skills as you grow up. But we get really rigid in terms of thinking that we only teach our boys to mow a lawn, what we don't teach our girls, or we only teach our girls how to bake brownies and not our boys. So we really have to work to counteract our language and our expectations. When we look at this later on, the big place where this shows up is careers, right? We're constantly saying to our girls, she would make a great nurse. And to our doc our boys we say, he would make a great doctor. Well, then we end up with a lot of gender disparity later on in terms of the STEM professions. And if you don't know what that is, you should look it up. But anyway, science, technology, engineering, math. And we want to encourage both girls and boys to go into that. But we have to do that actively. We have to counteract the sexual stereotypes that are there, the gender stereotypes that are there. So, in closing, let's talk for a minute about how to reduce some gender stereotypes. First of all, language matters a lot. We always have to be aware of our language. In fact, I'm going to challenge you to find some mistakes that I made 
in this little 10 minute podcast that used gender inappropriate language, gender stereotyping language, gender rigid language, language that promotes gender bias. Find some. I'm sure you can. So even like my choice of the word husband instead of spouse is a good example, but find some other examples of how I do that. We do that every day in our language and we're not always aware of it. So watch our language. Second thing, we want to be good role models in parenting. Okay, We want to do things that are across gender. So the male person in the family, if there is one, should not always drive with the female person sitting in the passenger seat. The male person should not always take out the trash. The female person should not always clean the sinks and toilets. Both people should cook. Both people should do laundry. Both people should mow the lawn. Both people should do engage in a lot of different activities to let kids know that it's not just women's work to change diapers or it's not just man's work to take out the trash or whatever it is. But we have to, again, work and talk about those things and do those things. Third thing you can do, help really honestly limit your kids exposure to media the media is terrible in terms of the stereotypes it promotes and if you don't believe me listen to pretty much any song out there exception there's some good songs by Macklemore right now same love comes to mind that don't promote promote gender stereotypes but otherwise if you listen to a world of songs right now or TV shows you see a lot of gender stereotyping. So you really want to limit kids' exposure to that. Or if they get exposed to it, talk to them about it. Explain like, you know, I know that TV show shows this, but that's not really what I believe. Or what do you think about that? Or that's a kind of different than, than it should be, isn't it? Or whatever else you want to say. The other thing you really want to expose kids to, diversity, diverse jobs, diverse people, people who have all different kinds of jobs that are... Um, women who are judges, women who are police people, police officers, all different kinds of things to get kids, men who are nurses, to get kids exposed to the idea that your job does not depend on your body parts or your anatomy. Your job should really be a good fit with your skills. And your skills and your traits matter most in terms of what job is suited for you more so than your body parts or your chromosomes. So, it would be cool to think about, to talk more about Carter and what folks think, how will Carter grow up and what will that mean for Carter, and to think about what you can do in your own life to reduce gender stereotyping and think about examples from you that you engage in gender stereotyping every day because we all do it. Okay, thank you very much for listening. Dr. Beatty, thank you very much for asking me. I hope you have a wonderful day, and I hope you learn a lot of cool things today. Otherwise, it's a waste of a day if you're not learning. Okay, take care.